In this episode, my friend Doug Jones joins me in a conversation. He's a friend and a colleague out of Dalton, Georgia. He's a Nelson Nash practitioner, and he's been in the financial services industry over 30 years. He really knows what's going on in the big, wide world today. We had fun, and I hope you enjoy. Thank you for listening. Welcome to the Bank with Life podcast. I'm your host, James Nethery. And look, I'm always excited to have friends and clients on and acquaintances. And let me tell you why I'm so excited today. My friend, Doug Jones, is out of uh, Dalton, Georgia. He's an agent advisor. He's been in the industry a long time. So uh, he's a friend, a colleague, and... um. He's the salt of the earth. You know, he's absolutely pushing back the frontiers of ignorance. My words, repeating from Nelson Nash. Um, and he's been very gracious to share his time with us. And we're just, we, we're going to have an unstructured conversation. And we invite you to listen if you wish. So good morning, Doug Jones. How are you, sir? I am doing great, Mr. Nathery. How are you doing today? I'm living the dream, trying to make it look easy and not make yeah. mistakes. Good. That's a, um, it's a thing you wake up doing every day, you know, trying to be the best you you can be. And um, that's what uh, what we try to do here. And uh, the, be- the, the better we can be, the, the better our clients will, uh, will be. And um, that's just a focus of our life and a passion of, of what we, we try to do every day. Yep, I, I hear you. That's why I like you, sir. Okay, now his he has a company, MaximumWealth.net is his website. Yes. And then Maximum Wealth with Doug Jones is your podcast, right? That is correct. That is correct. All right, perfect. So tell us who you are and what you do, Douglas, and why it matters, please. Very, very simple, James. Uh, Doug Jones is my name, and um, I've been in this uh, advising or financial services business for uh, – yeah, 34 years now, and um, it's just gotten better and better. Uh, I think that uh, we are probably in the best position that we can be in after the years of experience that, that you and I both have. I know you've been in the business for a long time, and um, it's just a time period right now, and maybe you know God had us in this place uh, early on to, to get to this point to understand uh, truth, to understand, uh, you know, the, the the freedoms that people deserve, uh, the security that people need, uh, the opportunities that people should be afforded. And I think what our duty is as advisors is not so much to chase an interest rate or chase a rate of return, but to help people understand really what's going on with their money and helping them to to look at all aspects of their money to see how it can be better, how it can be more useful, how it can be more efficient. And uh, that's that's our passion here is to, is really just to help people have more money uh, and more opportunity and more freedom with their money. But it's not about chasing an interest rate or a rate of return. There's a lot more to it than that. I hear you. Now, look, you're, you are a uh, – practitioner at the nelson nash institute as well right yes sir. yes sir. and i know i don't know how long ago we met it seems like a long time um maybe 10 years eight nine years i don't know yeah yeah and did we meet at the nelson nash institute or just within the life insurance industry do you remember do you yeah remember? i met you i met you at one of the uh, think tanks and um briefly i don't think we had any conversation lengthy conversation i remember you from there but um i remember the um we shared a uber when uh we were going to a meeting in cincinnati and um you i remember that because you were not feeling well and you were sniffing and sneezing and and had a pretty bad cold so i was trying to stay on the other side of the car of the back seat (laughs) (laughs) and um but i but i was enjoying our time together and and i knew i liked you you're from uh you know texas and i'm I'm a a texas fan and enjoy have a lot of friends and enjoy coming to texas and visiting so i wanted to get to know you and and our relationship took off and it's been uh it's been great and i've really enjoyed our time and being with your family and and that type of thing well i appreciate that and i I remember that uh i did not leave knowing that i was coming down with something that's no (laughs) we live in a new age now you know you gotta you gotta preface with that yeah yeah that was yeah that was pre-covid for sure but okay that that makes sense and then uh 
And I know that, you know, without mentioning life insurance companies' names, I mean, you've been around the industry a long time, and you're, you are currently on the fact the field advisory committee of a substantial life insurance company and someone a life insurance company that has a big, pretty big footprint you know in the infinite banking world uh and i as well am and have been on that fact and then our friend uh barry dock has also been on the that fact and so when we go to Cincinnati, and I know the listener can figure out what company we're talking about if yeah. they wish to, um, and that's not the only company that either of us represent, right, right or offer our clients, or even own personally. So I'm sure. tr- trying to promote a life insurance company, but you wind up on a fact of a life insurance company because of your experience, who you are, what kind of business you you produce in the field. So. They, they do listen, and so the life insurance company, everyone has a field advisory council, and they use it to get feedback from producers in the field to deliver mm-hmm. you know, a greater value or the best value that they can to the right. consumer, you know, the ultimate end user, the client. So, sure. um, so you're very well respected in the industry or you would have never received that invitation, right? Well, that's, that's very kind of you to say, thank you very much. Um, yeah, it's true too though. So, right. all right. Uh, no, you're welcome. And look, um, you know, so what you see and, and speaking back to, you know, what you said earlier, just, we're just trying to help the, our clients do better be better, be more free and independent, especially with their money and their finances. So really, I think I find that the all-American average family really doesn't know uh, kind of what's going on because there's never really been a focus that's promoted. You know, we're, and what I mean by that, the, you know, Wall Street the whole narrative is just put your money with, you know, a quote unquote financial advisor, go into the market, get a tax deduction to to do that and and then hope everything goes well and then look up in your retirement and hope you've done well. Not that's oversimplifying, but you know, that's pretty much it. And you know, if yeah, you do that I agree. Yeah, you wind up in retirement with a hodgepodge of accounts. Maybe your brother-in-law is, you know, an investment advisor, your sister-in-law, your other brother-in-law, your other cousin wrote life insurance. You got some, you know, 401ks or some kind of qualified plan, 403B, 401k, Roth IRA, 457 plan, a TSP plan. And maybe you change careers all along the way. So you wind up in retirement, you have all of these accounts, and none of them are really consistent or congruent with each other. Um, that's been my experience quite often over the last 30 or so years is has that been your experience and thanks for letting me ramble on with that no no you're you're exactly right i mean everything you were saying it was you you did go for a little while there but but there was so much and, and there is so much that people are involved in and that you, and i was i was kind of getting into everything that you were saying and it was um it, it's amazing at what people have become involved in and what they've been told and what they've been shown whether it's from a cpa whether it's from a financial advisor whether it's from a, uh, a person at the bank uh they're property and casualty agent. Everybody today that has anything to do with money seems to come across as some type of financial advisor. Uh, but I don't know that they know that much about money. You know, money money is something that uh, has so many different facets to it, whether you're at the Fed level or whether you're over here just trying to start up a, uh, an account for college uh, for your teenager going off to college and, and this everything all over the place as far as the different types of, of ways that money works. And to me, what we've done in the financial planning industry, I don't know that it's really changed that much from the perspective of putting money in a, in a product and hoping it works. But we've made it so confusing. We've made it so complicated. And it's really, really simple if you really understand money and stop trying to get into all the new products and the bells and the whistles and the different apparatus that people use to digitally invest and what other uh, advisors are using to to move people's money around. And in, in every way that I look, it seems to be that it's really about separating people from their money 
rather than putting more money back in their pockets or making their money grow. And the system is really designed to help those that are managing the money more so than it's helping the people that are the ones putting the money in the plans. Do you see what I'm saying? Does it I make know, sense? Yes, it makes sense. And I've experienced that. I think unless, unless you hear it as a listener yeah. or unless you experience it, you know, it's not it's not really a reality, right? I mean, but yes. once you think that through, look, the game is rigged, in my yes. opinion. Yes. And it, and, it is, and it is not set up for your favor, you, the all-American, average, you know, and I know the listeners are yes. above average. I'm not saying that. Yeah. The all-American family, you know, and it's like, it's complicated, as you said, and, uh, you know, you got rules to do this rules to do that and i understand rules i'm generally compliant not yeah. uh i mean i don't do anything that's you know illegal or esoteric or I'm, but i'm just saying i don't want to jump through the bankers i don't want to jump through uncle sam's rules you know i don't want to jump through the the right. i mean i'll comply and pay the taxes that i owe and i don't want to pay one dollar more than i owe but i don't want to get right. some kind of a a fallacious discount on taxes later at the expense of my money today. Um, so I'm completely with you. And if I can say, look, I spoke with an attorney the other day. <clears throat> um, I'm always looking for referral relationships, you know. Sure. Um, sure. My CPAs are getting old and retiring. <laughs> the attorneys are getting old and retiring. Yeah. Or they're becoming so – uh, where they just can't take new clients, right? right. Um, so I've been interviewing attorneys. If you're not excited to get up every day and interview attorneys, oh, you're not living. <laughs> <right>? <laughs> but I got to share one with you. Uh, we're going through this individual. He's a great guy, salt of the earth. Um, you know, I'm not just calling up people out of the phone book or Rolodex. You know, I'm getting referrals. They're already competent. They're working with competent people. Um, and I'm talking to this young man, Doug, okay, and he kind of is outlining his method of uh, estate planning. So he's a, a, a tax attorney and an asset protection attorney and a business attorney. That's where he focuses, all right? Yeah. And there's a lot of overlapping in there. Okay. So we're going through, you know, he has it in step one, step two, or phase one, phase two, phase three. And one of the phases – early on was making sure beneficiary designations were correct across the okay. estate. Okay. Right. okay. And, and in conversation, um, you know, and that might cost somebody, that's just, that's just build at an hourly rate, whatever the attorney bills at the hourly rate. Sure. All right. And it could uh -huh. be one hour. It could be 10 hours, depending yeah. on how many accounts and how complicated it is. Absolutely. Right? Absolutely. And then you might get an hourly discount if it, you know, hits five or six hours. I don't know. Yep. So I'm going through that. I mean, I'm listening. We're talking. And I told him, uh, number one, that I was underpriced, okay, um, not pricing my services appropriately. Yeah. But, uh, you know, through the years doing retirement seminars and, and just retirement planning and income planning, I told him that I used to offer a free steak dinner when I did a seminar, if anyone in the room had all of their beneficiaries correct on all of their accounts, right? Yeah. And, uh, and you know how many steak dinners I had to buy? I would think very little. Not one. Not wow. a single one. Wow. And the only time that I have seen in my experience the beneficiary designations correct across their accounts, right? And these can yeah. be complicated uh, yeah. as far as, you know, uh, old accounts, IRAs, 401ks, and what have you. It, the only time I've seen them correct is if they had just recently finished, you know, working with an estate planning attorney. Yeah. And, yeah. Uh, so, you know, I want to make a point here that, you know, I'm – we're in the life insurance business, right? I mean, I'm an investment advisor representative as well. We write a lot of guaranteed products. And and I tell the young men coming and the young people coming into the industry that I work with and mentor, you know, you've got to know not only a broad uh, swath of knowledge, you must have a broad 
knowledge base, right? Mm -hmm. Where if you're an attorney, and I'm not picking on, I'm just explaining. Like if you're an attorney, you know, you've got to go very deep into your specialty, whatever it is. Yes. If if you're uh, a CPA, you've got to go very deep into the tax code, right? And then deep into the specialty if you're working with real estate investors or what have you. As a life insurance agent in general, not only do you have to have a broad swath of knowledge, but it must be deep in all of those areas. So Absolutely. And I think I was told that early on in my career, and I didn't even know what that meant. I couldn't even understand that. Yeah. But now, 30 years later, I understand that crystal clear. Yeah. Yeah. What's what's interesting about what you're saying there, too, is because people, it's amazing to me that you can talk to individuals and for them to come across. And, and this is a, a lot of clients and, and, and not so much mine now after you educate them. But when you first meet someone, it's amazing to me at how much people think they know about life insurance. <laughs> and it's one of the most complicated, in-depth financial products i don't know that there's another financial product out there that's more complex and more complicated than a life insurance the mechanics of the life insurance contract how that thing is put together how it can be built how it can be arranged and and that's that's one of the problems i have with with dave ramsey and his you know by term and invest the difference aspect of it is because he just discounts so many aspects of the life insurance contract just like it's not even 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 there or important and when he says that you know by term and, and and never by whole life um what what does he say about the amount of bank owned life insurance that's out there in 22 billion dollars worth of cash value uh owned by jp morgan um or the the billions of dollars of cash value through 38 different banks uh the corporate owned life insurance it is all it is all uh you know permanent forms of life insurance that, that have cash value but he acts like that those things are just it's negligible it's not even not even an issue and you know, it, it is a very complex part of the person's uh, legacy planning of uh, trust and financial planning for a um, uh, for individuals and for corporations. So it, it's, it's amazing to me that people think they know and understand life insurance when there, there's absolutely no way they they understand it. And um, it, it's just very hard a lot of times to, to get people to unlearn what they think they know to learn what is really right about something and how to proceed forward because that's it's really the only tax-free part of the tax code, 7702, 7703. Those are the, the life insurance tax code uh codes there and and it is the only tax freeze that are out there uh, available in the market today well the Roth can be tax free that's true I'm sorry it's the Roth you're but you're so limited with the Roth I really don't I really don't count the Roth that's just something they've thrown out there for people to play with and uh, to think they're going to add to but I mean putting in you know six thousand or whatever number that is a year uh that's that's not saving money that's just that's that's playing you know, I, we're not we're not capitalizing when you when you are putting the when the government allows you to put five or six thousand a year into a place to to be able to save for retirement it's really quite a joke you know, I, I completely agree <laughs> i mean when you're you know. putting money back for retirement you better be putting 20 30 percent of your income back not not five thousand what now there there you go there's some truth right there because i i say that uh i agree with that and i generally start out that you know um every day you know i get up and our whole team shows up. We have a fabulous team, and I know you do too, it's to take care of our clients, right? But then it's to push back the frontiers of ignorance or to maybe affect someone's thinking, right? Because you, you covered a lot of ground there. You know, Nelson used to say, and I completely agree, and you're saying the same thing, but Nelson said that the uh, most people's understanding of life insurance is based on someone else's misconception absolutely beautifully said said. it's true and then um people like dave ramsey 
and and even the noisemakers in the industry because there's a lot of noise out there you know in every aspect of the financial industry including the life insurance industry yes um and they all seem to want to focus on one point. It has to be either the internal rate of return or the cost of the death benefit. You know, in traditional or not tra- typical financial planning, they only use life insurance as a death benefit, completely discounting the uh, characteristics of banking, which was what Nelson amplified. All he did was add scale to what could be done with a dividend paying whole life insurance policy. Um, so I think that if people like Dave Ramsey and the noisemakers, I think most of them are sincere, and I think most of them are sincerely wrong. People like Dave Ramsey, I cannot believe that he doesn't know. I, I think he's more intelligent than that. Okay, now I may be giving him too much grace right there. Um, so I think he does know. Right, I just can't wrap my mind around him not knowing. But he can't change gears because he's made whole life insurance the enemy of his whole uh, yeah. marketing shtick, and it's a marketing okay. shtick. You know, Dave yeah. Ramsey sells more advertising yeah. than almost anybody. And then I don't even talk about or get into the ELP, how much they have to pay their endorsed local providers. And I'm a capitalist. I'm I'm wow. fine with capital and absolutely flows and profits the man's got a money printing machine going on beating right. up the life insurance industry yeah so no no you're you're exactly right and he is a master marketer i, I think I, I the other person that i think that i think of when i think of master financial marketers um i think we've got Susie orman out there she's a master marketer and i think ken fisher with fisher investments those three people are master marketers. I, I, I do not um, adhere or, or believe in their philosophies whatsoever, but they are master marketers and are able to get that message out and, and keep things in such a simple way that it satisfies people's um, appetite for what they need to do. Now, whether it's the right thing or the wrong thing, um, people really have to learn to look at, a, at it from a long-term perspective. I don't think our society is geared towards that anymore. Everything is geared towards a short-term uh, quick fix. And, and that's what these people are feeding off of. And it's such a shame that they have found a way to market to to, uh, to uh, quench that thirst for a quick fix to so many millions of Americans and it has caused them really to let go and lose control of their finances and, and not take the time to dig down and really understand what's going on uh, with, with their day to day, you know, money management and movement of money throughout their life. Yep. I agree. You know, I, I call them, they are marketers, you know, Orman, you know, hates life insurance or permanent really? life insurance, hates annuities. You know, Finn Kisser hates annuities. You know, well, yeah. how's the market going over the last, you know, what? And I'm not a, I'm not a market prognosticator and I don't think the market's bad and evil. I just think they're every market across the face of the earth is manipulated. All right. I believe that. But it doesn't mean you can't make money in the market. No, not at all. You know. Not at all. Because it is a zero-sum game, right? So if somebody's losing money, there's somebody directly on the other side that's making money. Yeah. Oh, and that's what people I don't think understand is when that market goes down and money is lost, they've convinced the American public that it's okay to lose that money, especially early on in your life because that simple phrase, oh, you've got time to make it back. Well, what, what does that mean? Um, you've got, you may not, nobody knows when they're going to die. Nobody knows when they're going to need money. So it's, to me, that's such a misnomer and such a lousy answer, but they've convinced the American people, especially the young people that, uh, you've got time to make it back up. So don't worry about losing it. Well, when you lose money, there's somebody that's getting that money on the other side. You just don't see them. And it's gone from you to them. So why not just ride down the road and throw it out the windows of your car? That's really what you're doing when you're participating in a bear market and going along with it and listening to your stockbroker say, oh, don't sell. Just hang in there. It'll come back and you're losing 10, 20, 30 percent of your money. 
To me, it's ridiculous. And people really need to think about it from a common sense perspective rather than just listening to the rhetoric that's coming from these, quote, fiduciary advisors. Yeah. Just uh, it's not a real loss. It's just a paper loss until you sell it. Right. Yeah. Well, yeah. you know, give uh, Congress time and they're going to tax that unrealized gain. And uh, yeah. they I wonder if they'll let you write off an unrealized loss if they tax the unrealized gain. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I right. think we know the answer to that. <laughs> I shouldn't ask questions. I know the answer to <laughs> it's, it's a very minimal write off for a realized gain. So right. I don't think they're going to allow uh, any write off for a unrealized gain. You know? Yeah. Isn't that something, you know, you, you uh, you're paying the tax. It's a character, long term, short term on a gain that you realize. Right. And, and so, the, you know, short term, long term, uh, but you're, you're paying it on the whole amount. You know, if I take a, a long term gain this year, I'm going to pay an uber high capital gains tax, right? If I take a short term next year, you know, going past the holding period, I'm still going to pay a lot of taxes. It just won't be as high as a short term gain. But if I lose, I can I'm limited on what I can write <laughs> off and carry over. That's right. Yeah. That's right. Just part it's, of the it's not again, again, like you said earlier, it's a rigged game. Yeah. It's a rigged, it's not for the consumer. These these 401ks, the IRAs, all these government based plans or, or government uh, formed plans, they are not for the consumer. Wall Street is not designed for the consumer. These things are confiscation apparatuses to separate you from your money. And it's about understanding how this money is being taken from you over a period of time systematically to to help you realize. See, I, I feel like personally people are making plenty of money. There, there's people are making incomes. They're making good incomes. They've got lots of money uh, available to them if they're working. But. It's where that money goes after they get it. Because if you look at someone 35 years old and you look at making fifty to $100,000 a year, maybe more, over the next 30 years when they're 65, there's going to be six, eight, ten million $10 million that go through their hands. So where does all this money go? Well, right off the top, 30% of it goes to taxes. You know, and that's at a minimum. Um, then there's another 30 or 40 percent that they're going to pay in finance charges. So about 60 or 70 percent of the money that you get over your lifetime is either in taxes or finance charges. So what if we focus on that? What if we try to put people in positions just to reduce the taxes and to eliminate financing? And that's all Nelson talked about through his uh, his book, the um, becoming your own banker. And that, that's the whole purpose of what what we try to do here is not so much chasing that interest rate, make your four to six percent on a consistent basis, but eliminate those things on the back end that are t- totally uh, eating away at about 60 or 70 percent of your money over your lifetime um, that you're not even thinking about or, or, or conscious of at the time. Yeah. Does that yeah. make sense? Yeah, complete. So and uh, and I love the solution. You know, we can talk about the problems. You know, and uh, because they exi- they exist. You know, the yes. the uh, the construct that we live in is real. You know, yes. um, the amount of debt that we are. I mean, I feel like, <clears throat> um, lack of better terminology, you know, we're born into this debt slave construct, and we don't Absolutely. even realize it until you know years down the road, and we never even had right. a choice in it, really. Right. That's right. So yeah. the solution is powerful. And then, but we can also, you know, and it's like really, this is uh, April of 2022. I mean, you can't really uh, not talk about inflation, right? I mean, yeah, it's a 41 year high now. Okay. Uh, that's not going to change. I mean, as far as inflation, the, the rate's going to go up and down depending on, you know, the uh, egregious management and mistakes that, you know, the Fed and all the, you know, the, 535 criminals up in Washington do. Um, <laughs> yeah. Anyway, and, and I'm le- I'm leaving out the Supreme Court. You know, I don't really want to leave those 12 out. But my whole point here don't, is... Don't leave them out. They're really probably more important than all the others. They're the ones actually overruling what Congress is doing. I think our judicial system is really the probably the problem with what we're dealing with here. But go ahead. Anyway, I'm sorry. I yeah, they, have, they haven't overruled the state since the uh, 20s. 
Yeah. Right. If you look yeah. at the Supreme Court, they're part and parcel part of the problem. And yeah. I say it's all, you know, you take big pharma, you take Wall Street, you take the the state, the, you know, yeah. the the politicians, um, the financial, you know, Wall Street, did I, did I leave them out? So Wall Street, big pharma, you know, the news media, the politics, the state, it's all a big incestuous cesspool, you know, um, and they just swap, you know, the, the FDA heads, they retire or get go to uh you know the uh, pfizer or, and i don't want to name all the names but into the into the big pharma industry it's just back and forth you know and then you look up these world leaders across the country you know they're they're like uh morgan stanley or goldman sachs you know retirees or you know klaus fobs you know little uh water boys and they come up <laughs> you know leading the countries up north you know fidel castro's bastard child up there and i don't oh, know yeah. if that's true or not but they look a lot like anyway don't but the solution at the you and me level is really what we focus on because we can't change all that we can't we can't change the narrative we can't change the no. construct you know no. what I mean? other yeah. than what we do with ourselves and the uh the the uh you know doing what is right you know taking the right actions and being an example of what to do and what not to do i mean so it's not like we're you know, we should all get mad and quit and go home uh, because we are called, and I, I feel like I'm called. We are called, you know, Absolutely. to push the the truth forward. You know, and then, and we're just talking about when it when it really comes to money at the you and me level that we shouldn't be swayed by chasing rates of returns. We can't control yes. the market. We can't no. control the interest rates. We can't control no. the tax structure. No. We can control where we put our money. And in a limited form, we still have control over our cash flows. Where does our yes. money go? How Absolutely. do we put our money to work? Um, and if we learn the infinite banking concept, from becoming your own banker, um, there is an awful lot of unlearning. No question about that. I think, you know, I probably do uh, more of that than anything is, you know, um, trying to inc increase our clients' awareness and thinking, you know, of the construct and then what is possible. Um, and it really doesn't take much. It's like a lever, you know, or, or leverage. It really doesn't take um a, a lot you know if we make minor adjustments we can have a a, yes. a huge result yes so um well i everything you're saying you're you're right on with with everything that you're saying and and i feel like people again are looking at everything from a short-term perspective rather than a a long-term perspective um, one thing I've, I've got a question for you, James, and, and it's, it's a question I, I'm asking the question so we can discuss it. But I, I wonder why is there such an effort by the financial services industry to move money from safe positions to risk positions? Because all of your financial entertainment, your Ramseys, your Ormonds, your Fishers, all those people, there's no mention of protection of money. There's no, no mention uh, from the financial um, uh, services industry about putting seatbelts on your money. It's, it's really all about getting that money into a position to where they can have it, they can play with it, they can do what they want to with it, and they really had no skin in the game. So, you know, if it makes money, if it loses money, they're just really, it looks like they're in it for the transaction rather than for trying to help people grow their money. And, and what, what is the reason there to, to, uh, to either avoid or disregard protection of people's money in the financial services industry? You know, I appreciate you asking me that question. Like I could give you a complete answer to it. Thank you. <laughs> I'll share my opinion, what I have come to believe over 31 years in okay. the financial industry as a financial advisor, back in the day, a registered representative, life insurance agent, and then meeting Nelson about mm -hmm. 16, 17, 18 years. I know I don't look that old, right? Uh, yeah. Here's what I've come to believe. That it's just kind of like social media now. You know, if you don't 
uh, toe the party line, which is generally the opposite of truth, you get deplatformed, right? And so the financial entertainers are are water boys, whether they know it or not, whether they're directly paid or not, for Wall Street. So that narrative, they're almost protected. None of them are licensed, right? So they can say anything they want. Um, you know, and I have my opinions on what a license actually is. Um, but so that that gets them paid, right? So the, their narrative, whatever they're promoting, their their educational materials, you know, their ELP programs, you know, and I don't know, but I'm, I've heard, I don't have an article that I can point to um, what I've read. And when I say I heard, I've read and, and uh, perused an article that was referencing a previous article that you know ken fisher had a large ownership ownership position in a stock life insurance company that their primary product is annuities yeah you know so yeah. um conflict you know you hear what yeah. Susie Orman, where she puts her money yeah. you hear what you know dave ramsey's doing and what his wife uh requires him to carry as far as insurance goes and i don't know all of that but i do know this that that narrative putting money in the market to get a higher rate of return so we can overcome inflation so we can um outrun taxes you know a tax sheltered annuity and a tax sheltered account of some kind right that has risk. so we're trying to shelter from taxes when you think that through that's not even legitimate a tax break today in the lowest tax bracket we've been in for i don't know until 2025 and the sunset provision um compared to uh yeah, let me tie my money up and hope that I'm in a lower tax bracket in the future. That's a fallacy. But Wall Street's getting paid by following that narrative, right? And then if you go back in history, you know, the mutual funds didn't even exist until the late 30s. You know, tax qualified plans didn't even exist until the uh, late 80s or the 80s yeah. when the Keogh plan, yeah. the Keogh plan. And yeah. life insurance, as we're speaking, uh, has existed for over 200 years. The tax code didn't even come into existence in its current right. form until 1913. And right. then even then, they were trying to finish paying for the Spanish-American War of 1898. <laughs> I mean, and then, all right, so to answer your question, it's profitable for Wall Street. They don't get deplatformed. You know, they're, they're, they get uh, more money. They're more profitable because they're the water boys for Wall Street. And it's not in their interest, right? to have their consumers put money in a in, in anywhere that they don't control wall street so that leads into another point that i want to make you know uh, <laughs> okay our friend uh barry dot came on uh, i think last week it'll be released in the next few days or the next couple of weeks but um you know he's updating his book yes and, uh, a researcher among researchers and so we you know, he's talking about the hedge funds and the private equity groups that are buying life yeah. insurance uh, companies, stock companies. Yes. Um, and so that's happening. So, look, if they can't control the uh, – why why would a hedge fund buy a life insurance company, number one? Because right, they have all the reserves, right? They have all the capital, and they're going to practice yeah. banking whenever they yeah. own the life insurance. They already do that now. Okay. Yes. Um, and my question was this, and I'm like, well, listen, Barry, I don't think that all this happens in a vacuum. You know, 7702 came out effective January 1 of 2022. The yeah. IRS required life insurance companies to lower – uh, for lack of better terminology, a discount rate to price life insurance and to calculate a MEC, which made life insurance death benefit go down. So then the life insurance death benefit becomes more expensive. OK, you can still practice banking. It's a beautiful thing. But that didn't happen in a vacuum because that 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 got slid into the uh, Appropriations Consolidated Tax Act, whatever the name of that is. I can't recall. Mm -hmm. On like uh, December 23rd. All right. Okay. Okay. And so then it becomes effective, you know, 12 months later, January 1 of 2022. Right in the beginning of all of these hedge funds and private equity groups buying life insurance companies. Yeah. It is yeah. a boon to the life insurance company. And therefore, it is a boon to the hedge fund and the uh, private equity groups that are no buying doubt. these companies. No now, doubt. You know, and, and look, if you go back into the 80s when the IRS looked at the uh, 
single premium life insurance policies and came up with the mech, right? They looked at the life insurance and said, hey, uh, this is too good to be true. You know, it's like it's a tax loophole for the rich. Then you had the term promoters of the day and the bond promoters and Wall Street saying, yeah, that's a tax loophole for the rich because they couldn't produce the results that life insurance did. Yeah. All right. All right. Well, right after that, they all start demutualizing, you know, and then and then in comes, you know, the uh, the uh, the uh, Ralph Nader types, you know, the consumer advocate, you know, life insurance is bad. And you got to unbundle it so we can have clarity. Yeah. So the life insurance companies demutualized and then came up with this universal life. None of that happened in a vacuum is my point. And none of this yeah. is, today is happening happening in a vacuum and then to round out your question sir i know it's a long answer you're, no you're good I'm, I'm listening to every bit of this you're good i believe wholeheartedly that the government would like to take over the financial services industry just like they've taken over the healthcare industry absolutely right. absolutely it's, it's, it's control it's control of the money and when you control the money you control the people's lives and then you, when you control the lives, you control the people. And, yeah. um, and that's, that's what, and they're doing it in such a drip, drip, incremental fashion uh, with all of this SECURE Act and, and, and all these crises that are happening. Um, if it's not in the U.S., it's over in the Ukraine or it's over in China or where there, there's always crises. And, and they, these, they've turned these crises into a, a global uh, issue where they're, they're jumping from com- uh, country to country every so many months with a new crisis and which obviously affects everybody else in the world. And um, no, I think it's, it's a, there's a large fear factor going on here with the media, uh, which I think is complicit in this takeover of people's lives. And um, I just, uh, I, in case in point, I had a, a, a person, one of my clients to pass away in the last couple of weeks. And they came to me with, uh, the, the family came to me with a variety of life insurance policies and some with a company that had demutualized uh, several years ago and wanted me to make sure these policies were, were alive or not in effect anymore, you know, just checking to see where they were at. We've we've contacted three different chains because that particular company demutualized about, I don't know, maybe 10 years ago when it demutualized. But we've gone through three different companies. We've just found out the company is located in the Caymans that actually owns Mm -hmm. the 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 policies that has these policies uh, in the the, the money of these. And we we cannot find out if these policies are actually active or not, uh, because we can't get in touch with with those folks in the Caymans to. uh, And it was a very large life insurance carrier, uh, monumental uh, transition there when that happened. Uh, back 10 years or so ago. But uh, that was the case in point that the, these companies, and it was a, a hedge fund or a private equity group that come in to buy these contracts and um, have just, I don't know, put, again, it, it's not about the consumer. It's not about taking care of the people out here. It's all in the in the name of uh, it. And I, and I hate to say this because I'm a, it, as big a capitalist as there is out there, uh, it's corporate greed. Yeah, it's corporate greed. It's like it's, it's like there's there, there's laws and rules and regulations and ethics and morals and all that that people should be living by. But once that greed sets in, it's, it just overtakes the, the system. And, and it's all about stockholders and the bottom line and, and, and the people are. And, and that's what's so bad about this industry, James, is the life insurance industry has always been about the people, the people they serve the people they represent, paying death claims for widows and orphans, for those that are left behind. And what they've turned it into is they've been able to infiltrate it, and now they're going in and and really becoming leeches and sucking the blood out of these companies from these reserves and from these uh, powerful, strong, safe institutions and, and just kind of more or less destroying the uh, the cornerstone of our country because I feel like the life insurance industry is the cornerstone of this country and has, has been for a very, very long period of time. 
Yep. I think that uh, I can agree with that on a, on a lot of levels. You know, the uh, the corporate, these are corrupt corporations. It's, it's like corporatism. It's like mercantilism. Yes. These are not corporations. I mean, they were at one time, yeah. you know, corporations or even a mutual company that, that existed for the benevolent of the benevolence of their 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 client and their owners right so um and they're they're no question they're being taken over and then you know they're demutualized right and the one you're talking about and then the, and then that puts them in a position then they're 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 writing you know universal laptop products that, that is much more for the most profitable products in the life insurance industry for a life insurance company is universal life and term i can't get a clear answer on which one's more profitable right yeah. one of them has a more volume of premium so maybe it's more profitable right right but th- right. so these companies are you know they're cut up they're spun off and i call them they're in the bahamas you know the virgin islands um which 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 kind of came in islands yep. yeah yeah they're like glorified telemarketing companies is what they are that that yeah. speak English as a second language. Do I have uh, any problem with that? Not other than this, right? That is that was your capital, right? It was a contract that you purchased. You put your money in, and then it spun off to. I mean, the employees working at these places. I mean, there's. Right. You know, they're just getting up and getting paid and doing their job. Um, yes. So, I, I mean, I want to make sure I'm not, I mean, I have lots of bilingual clients. You know, I, I'm, I'm bilingual. I speak, you know, Southern and then I speak broken English. Right. <laughs> so, but my point is, it, it, like, you can't find, you can't find, you know, they've been purchased, sold, resold and resold. And you can't find yeah. at the end user. I mean, at the, the, the last company that owns a right. contract, they may not even know. I mean, we've gone through this many times in my office and today, I mean, we've taken measures to combat that. Okay. Yeah. Um, but it's like, if you don't have a copy of your contract, you don't have a copy of your contract. That's and when right. one of these companies buys 10 or 15 companies and puts them all in, you know, a, a service uh, position, yeah. it's like they may not even know what version of your contract that Absolutely. they're sitting there supposed to be guaranteeing. Absolutely. And then we have a generation or two later, and it's a quagmire of trying to get some of these yeah. paid sometimes. Yes. I mean, something something to the point of, of you were talking about the most profitable products there, the, the term insurance and the universal life. You know, the the, the promotion of term insurance, and we're, we're hitting Ramsey pretty hard here today, but the promotion of term insurance by him, if he is so conscious and so conscientious of, of helping people and saving people money and, and really um, uh, about you know, bashing these products that really are good products and should be used to be uh, to being uh, used to save money. He needs to look at how much term insurance actually pays off. <laughs> I mean, you've got a product that the insurance company markets. Unbelievable! I've never seen anything more marketed more than term insurance. Okay, but only about ninety nine point. I'm sorry, ninety nine point seven percent of term insurance never pays a claim and automobile insurance pays more claims than term insurance does. Yep. Okay. And so it's amazing to me that you, you get so many people buying into the fact that they're going to place a bet on something that is 99.7% chance they're going to lose. And here's a man that talks about it every day and sells that. And, and people won't take the time to realize or sit and think about what they're actually doing when they buy term insurance. That it's really, if they're going to issue you a 10 year or a 20 year term and insurance companies are masters of statistics, they've gone through your background, they've gone through your health, they know you. If they issue you a 10 year term, it's pretty much guaranteed you're going to live 10 years. They're not in place a bet and, and, and make themselves payment. They give you a 20 year term unless there's a train coming down the track and you're sitting playing with the rocks on the track. You're not going to die in 20 years. You can just about that's kind of like a crystal ball saying, I'm going to live another 20 years. If a term, if a life insurance company will give you a 20 year term. You see what I'm saying? Yeah, I agree with you. We should all go buy term insurance to get our life expectancy. You know, <laughs> that's how es- you can do it. Estimated it's, it's by an actuary. <laughs> if they'll issue that policy. 
see you just about guarantee if you're just careful from day to day, you're going to make it another 10 years or 20 years, however long they, um, they issue that term policy for them. Yeah. Well, then, and most people think that, you know, uh, whole life insurance or permanent and there is a difference between permanent and whole life. You know, universal life is is said to be permanent. It's not really. It's permanent well, if you pay the premium and everything goes your way and the company doesn't exercise their rights to increase the premium and, um, you know, and all of that. So whole life, I want to get to whole life. Um, yeah. People think, you know, because they've been, they've been told that it's, it's unaffordable. You know, it's like when you boil down life insurance to, you know, a million dollar term, if you listen to the radio ads, it's going to cost you $15 a month. That's not true, <laughs> right? Because that's, yeah. you know, the ultra super preferred. But, you know, a, a man 50, you know, buying a million dollars in term, maybe it's 2200 a year, 25. I don't know what the price is. Yeah. Okay. Well, if I'm going to buy that same amount in whole life, the premium is going to be much more. Oh, but how do we structure the policy? Can I structure the premium in such a way that, and I'm not even saying that typical uh, traditional whole life is bad, where it's right. just not structured any other way that, that pay sure. a premium. Um, because the cash value is guaranteed to equal the base amount at age 121. That's right. As long as you pay the premium. So, Absolutely. so um, if, if I'm going to buy whole life insurance, um, you know, the idea is, and in fact, it is higher when you compare death benefit to premium dollars. There's no question about that. But I can, especially if I'm practicing the infinite banking concept, I can focus on cash value accumulation. All right, so I'm paying a premium, so it's still costing me. There's no question about that. But I'm accumulating capital. Well, what is an IRA or 401k or wherever else you're putting money? You're putting money in there, and what's the future value going to be? Who knows? If I pay a right. premium to the life insurance company, I know what my future value is going to be Absolutely. at a minimum, and then I have a pretty dang good idea what it's going to be or what it could potentially be above the minimum. Yep. And then it's like, oh, okay, now then the then the paradigm of death benefit and premium starts to change, right? And so that's yeah. when it comes to like education or knowledge. I think the general public just doesn't know all of the characteristics of life insurance. No. I, they don't. And I no. think if they did understand, um, the uh, the narrative would change, the field would change, people, these these uh, entertainers, you know, if they educated themselves, yeah. the, whole, the whole end result could change at the you and me level. And that's that's very powerful, you know, and I discovered this over time, you know, with Nelson, um, you know, several years ago. And it's just it's 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 a completely different paradigm. If I am funding properly structured life insurance policies and maybe I'm using annuities for a guaranteed future income. Um yeah. It, it just changes the outlook and it changes the outcome, right? Listen, I, let me, let me, I didn't mean to interrupt you. I'm no, sorry. No, you're good. I'll tell you someone who does understand life insurance. The banking institutions understand life insurance, okay? Yes. Uh, Learn banking. Understand banking, folks. If you, if you want to understand life insurance, understand banking because banks have a precious position of money called tier one assets. These tier one assets are their most prized possessions and it's the foundation of the banking institution. And these tier one assets are protected and covered by life insurance. And where do the banks get the money to buy the life insurance from? They get it from you. You're putting your money into checking, savings, CDs, money market accounts. They're taking your money and loaning it out and making profits off of that money with fractional reserve banking, making tons of money. Understand fractional reserve banking. If you really want to know how banks make money, then that money they make, they're taking it and placing it into life insurance policies permanent life insurance policies on executives and on employees. And they're using this to guarantee and create surety that these pension plans are going to be funded, that health benefits are going to be funded, that retirement benefits are going to be funded. 
they they look after their employees and the retirement and security and the future of their employees by using permanent life insurance in their tier one assets. And if corporation if banks are doing this, if corporations are doing this, why in the world would individuals not wake up and see what is happening with the money they're giving to corporations and to financial institutions and say, why don't I do this for myself? rather than giving them my money and allowing them to do it for their employees and their own good. And that's that's such a, a hard thing for me to understand that people won't take the time to see where they're putting their money and these entities that they're giving their money to are actually using the profits that they're making on their money to buy life insurance with isn't that amazing? Yeah, I, but I think I agree with you. I think they just don't know. <laughs> yeah, you know, they don't. Look, <clears throat> some people don't want to know, right? Some people don't want to know. They just get up and do whatever they're going to do all day and day in and day out, and and that's okay. Uh-huh. I mean, um, I get it. Uh, you know, we're flooded with information, and and about eighty percent of it is misinformation. You know, in whatever genre you want to talk about. But I, yeah. I, I, in my heart of hearts, I believe they don't know. You know, they just don't know because if I they agree. did know. Then, yeah. then they would they would uh, take action, right? Yeah, and yeah. And, and, and I'm with you. If you got to understand fractional reserve banking at a certain level, and yeah. then because if you understand a bank and what they do and how they operate, you would want to become your own banker. You know, I mean, it's so obvious. It's so I really obvious. Don't plug things. The only thing I plug here is. Uh, you know, education. So you should, yes. the listener. 1,000%. Yeah. And buy the book, Becoming Your Own Banker. Buy the by R. Nelson Nash. Buy the second book, Building Your Warehouse of Wealth. Buy the book, uh, How Privatized Banking Really Works by Dr. Robert Murphy and Carlos Lara. Yes. And then, um, you know, you can even buy Nelson Nash's six and a half hour DVD series where he's given his presentation live. Yes. Um, and so you, the listener, should do that. Spend the money. I think I just went through about $250, $300 worth of material yeah. and, you know, six and a half hours plus some reading, you know, yeah. about 10 to ten to 15 hours, you'd have a solid foundation on what this idea is, uh, yeah. becoming your own banker, and what it could potentially mean to you and your family. So, yeah. you know. And, and back to Nelson. His, one of his favorite sayings to me was it will change your way of thinking. That's what really changes your life is when you change your way of thinking. And I, I, I want to add to, I want to throw this in to what we do and how we do it. We do it ourselves, James. We're not just, we're not, when we, when we talk with clients and we're communicating with clients, we're not telling them to do something that we're not doing ourselves. And, and I even use a lot of times the amount of money because I'll, I'll have someone come in and complain about having to, they may have had the policy in place and funding it for five, 10 years or something. And they're coming in complaining about having to contribute another contribution or, or premium to it. And it's like, I have to convince them to keep doing it. Well, I've kind of gotten to the point to where I'm just like, do it if you want to, because I know what I'm doing. I know what works. And, and I'll even go to the point of saying this amount that you're putting in is about 1% of what I put in every year. And so if you don't understand, if you don't agree, then I'm sorry. I, I don't want to continue to sit here and try to resell this thing to you every year. If you're not convinced after a period of time, if what this thing can do and how it works and, and it's people that's using it from a banking standpoint, from an accumulation standpoint, even have experienced death benefits from it, but it's still such a, uh, a roadblock there that they want to stop paying premiums, stop paying premiums. That's just such a, a big, uh, uh, idea in people's heads that I, I, I've gotten to the point where I'm just like, you know, if you can't get it, then we're done. I, I can't, I can't help you anymore. You know? yeah, no, the struggle <laughs> it's is really real. odd. It's, it's, you know, because it's, it's your money and all you're doing is transferring it from one account to another to be able to use it and enjoy it in a, a tax favored way. And, and oh, by the way, there's a windfall of money coming, not if you die, when you die. 
And uh, um, I don't know, it's just very simple to me, but it's, it's sometimes it's, a, it's a, a mountain to overcome with folks. You know, I, I experienced that, you know, and, and uh, our friend Gina Wells, you know, I quoted her when I spoke at the Think Tank this year, you know, and I think she was quoting her mentor and her his name it escapes my memory. Okay. But I think he told her and then I heard it from her. And, you know, she's a colleague in the financial services industry, a beautiful lady, wonderful lady. And uh, she said that her mentor said, if you have to drag them in, you have to drag them around. And it's so true. Um, and then Nelson. And I remember you saying that. You're exactly right. I remember you saying right. that. And, and I gave her credit, you know, and rightly so. Yes. But, uh, you know, Nelson used to say um, it's caught more than taught. Right. This idea that you can become your own banker is caught more than taught and and it's true and, yeah yeah you know, the, the struggle is real life insurance these policies are built to pay a premium you know can you yes. premium offset can you lower the premium yes you can do all kinds of creative things when you're working with a competent you know practitioner in my opinion um, yes who is not practicing on you right just like you said um you do it yourself i do it myself um you know, so I'm not practicing on them. Yeah. I've made I've made all the mistakes. I think I hope I've made all the mistakes I'm going to make when it comes to yeah. this. Probably haven't, but I made them on me. You know, and, exactly. And, Amen. That's right. And, and but that is a mindset. You know that life insurance is bad. That noise is prevalent. It's existing, and it's not going to change. You know, Wall Street wants all of your money and whatever government plan that that they come up with and whatever you know opportunity wall street comes up with to attract your capital which i found out i learned is bass backwards <laughs> whenever you have capital opportunities are attracted to the capital mm -hmm. wall street comes out and says hey i've created this great opportunity for you and i'm going to attract your capital yeah see the difference yes it's completely Absolutely. different so Absolutely. the struggle is real. And let me say this, too, as a side note, yeah. and this is not good. This is this would not be good for the listener to do. All right, Doug. But if you have a client that doesn't want to pay a premium and it's with a company that, you know, that I don't currently own or I don't currently write for, I'll be more than happy to write a check if they want to surrender that policy. I will buy their life insurance policy. <laughs> but I'm telling you now, the industry considers that you selling your mortality, so it's not good for you, and it's not good mm -hmm. for your beneficiaries. Uh, but right. It'll be good for me and mine, okay? So yes, it's really it's really about education, isn't it, James? It's really about understanding and, and taking the time to understand. And um, it's just a shame that more people don't do that. They just take it at face value from what they hear or what they've heard, and and not truly it because a, a two hundred year old product that has gone through wars, recessions, depressions, um, all types of changeover wars. I mean, you, you go on and on. Uh, the, the economic upheavals, the changes in legislation, uh, the different uh, administrations that we've gone through over the, the tenure of this United States. And for that product to still remain intact, to still have a contract, to still have a guaranteed cash accumulation, a guaranteed death benefit, a, uh, a guarantee to, to pay the people that are beneficiaries of this in, in an ironclad way, that's really quite amazing. And there's, there's no other financial product out there that will do what this one uh, will do with the benefits that it provides in a tax favored way. And, and for it to be just bastardized, and I don't mean that in an ugly way, but just to be looked at in such a horrible way, it, it, there's a war against it. There's a war against life insurance because it's a war to cheapen it. It's a war to to disregard it, to fund it minimally when it should be something that people should be pouring money into for themselves and for the ones they leave behind. And it's just it's really a shame the way it's looked at. It really is. And then and then, of course, the disparagement goes beyond the product and beyond the company to the agent right we yeah. uh, eviscerated our character yeah. and whatever you know we've talked about them i don't want to you know uh focus on the negativity too much but this guy just graduated a few weeks ago i think he was a historian uh 
Christian, writes a lot of books, and he hated life insurance, and he really disparaged the character of life insurance agents. And it's yeah. like, wow, that's a pretty broad brush. You don't even know me, G. And then it's like, yeah. I get to meet people like you, Doug Jones, that are salt of the earth, character, you know, stalwart character, great character, you know, a great right. example. And it's like, right. so the message is is a complete conflict with my experience, even yeah. over my career. Right. Within the, and I'm not saying that life insurance industry, the, the industry, the companies, or every guy, person writing life insurance is squeaky clean. You know, right. I have said many times a life insurance license is a, just a tad bit easier to get than the automobile driver's license so yeah. you know if anybody yeah. can get a license right and then yeah. if you talk to people oh my uncle did my brother did i did that i did that or they did this and then you look yeah. at the life insurance industry with the, the gangsters at our license you know the industry keeps giving them contracts right so and i've said that many yeah. times you know i never miss an opportunity to bust the chops of these insurance company officers it's like you're earning every black eye that you get just stop right. it. Just yeah. remember who you are. Remember your heritage. Remember your history and right. be what you are. Quit trying yes. to be everything else. And yeah. oh my gosh, it yeah. gets even easier when that happens. So Absolutely. Absolutely. All right, look, we're we're running on about uh, a little over an hour. So Okay. Uh, any any you wanna so let's just wrap it up. Any anything that you wanna close with or any points? You know, you I, I appreciate I appreciate the opportunity for this conversation. I uh, appreciate you and what you stand for. Um, there's not very many like us in in the world. I don't think that really want this message to get out about the life insurance product. It's uh, its ability to help families, to help individuals, to help businesses and institutions, and um, to to leave that legacy to leave. There's, there's nothing out there that's going to do that. And uh, I hate to see the financial services industry allow the destruction of this particular industry. And, and those that are in the industry, in the life insurance industry, kind of welcome in that that risk based mentality to say it's OK to come in and, and, uh, and, and do what you want to do with with the life insurance cornerstone of this country. Yeah, well said. And I agree with that. I hope that we're not the only ones. That reminds me of, I think it was Jeremiah. So I'm the only one. <laughs> no, no, there's more than you. Uh, so I hope that's yeah. the case here. You know, yeah. thank you for the kind words, Doug. Thank you for sharing your time with us and your experience. I'm uh, proud of you. I'm proud to know you. And uh, just thank you for, you know, what you do. Okay. Thank you very much. You're a great man. And uh, thank you for what you do. And uh, look forward to seeing you again soon, James. All right. Thank you. Take care, Doug. Hope you have a Thank great you. rest of your day. All right. Thank you, sir. You do you the bet. same. All right. Bye-bye. Right. Bye-bye. Thank you for joining us on the Banking with Life podcast. If you're watching on YouTube, make sure to like and subscribe and click on that little notification bell. Otherwise, join us on Apple Podcasts and Stitcher for weekly content. 